If you've listened to Bernie Sanders, then you've certainly heard him rant about taxing and going after the Wall Street billionaires, creating the illusion that socialism and communism are anti-capitalists. Today we'll discuss how, how Wall Street bankrolled the Bolshevik Revolution and continues financing Marxism. This is Anarchy in America with Christian Gomez. And joining me today in studio to discuss this and more is Alex Newman, foreign, cor- foreign correspondent for the New America and now senior editor of the New American, actually. Alex, thank you for uh, being with us here today. Thank you very much for having me, Christian. Great to be with you. So let's get right into it. So the Soviet Union, communist country, anti-capitalist, you know, that's the rhetoric even today from uh, Black Lives Matter, Antifa, and all the Marxist-Leninist groups in America. But... Are they really anti-capitalist? Is the Soviet Union, the communists, are they really that anti-capitalist? For example, how did Lenin and Trotsky and the Bolsheviks rise to power in Russia? Well, the truth is, Christian, that communism has always been a movement of the uber elites and the communist enslavement of Russia and what eventually became the Soviet Union was completely financed by some of the biggest quote-unquote capitalists in the world. Uh, I've actually got a list here. This was published in uh, the book Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution by Anthony Sutton and this is quoting from a U.S. State Department document dated 1918. Here's a list of some of the major bankers on Wall Street that financed the revolution. Uh, Jacob Schiff, Felix Warburg, Otto Kahn, Mortimer Schiff, Jerome Hanauer, and so on. So these are some of the world's top bankers at that time openly financing communism. And we see the same thing happening to this day. You've got Black Lives Matter, a movement founded by self-proclaimed Marxists, being funded by some of the biggest corporations in America, Google, Facebook, a lot of the Fortune 500s, the oil companies. Unbelievable. But So anybody who thinks that communism is a movement, of the downtrodden masses uh, is seriously misinformed. But we've been hearing Bernie Sanders, the probably the biggest communist in in the U.S. Senate, constantly say, we got to go after the 1%. So how exactly, um, why exactly would these uber elites, these capitalists, be financing the very movement that people like Sanders and Lenin back at the time said that they would go after? Well, the Bible says the, the love of money is the root of, depending on what translation you use all evil or all kinds of evil so clearly the the love of money is problematic these people have more money than they could ever possibly spend I, I mean they've got massive amounts of money but they know that their money is not going to be seized in these revolutions what they're really after I think is control um, they hate humanity they hate God they hate liberty they hate all the things that God has ordained they hate the family and so communism is a perfect vehicle for them then they don't have to worry about competitors they don't have to worry about uh, individual rights you just basically get a giant slave state. I think the best way to understand communism is really the reinstitution of slavery, but rather than just having a part of the population enslaved, you have virtually the entire population enslaved, except the uber elites who call all the shots. And I don't think you can understand communism unless you see it through that lens. So communism is not an anti-capitalist, anti-elitist movement as many of these downtrodden masses that are in the movement think that it actually is. Precisely. Lenin uh, famously reportedly called them useful idiots, right? Uh, and, and they're usually the first ones to be executed once the revolution takes over because, you know, they're all idealistic and they think, oh, we're going to take the money from the rich people and uh, equality and rainbows and unicorns. And then when they see, oh, actually, gulags, mass death, torture, slavery, starvation, they're suddenly not so thrilled. And so they get put up against the wall and shot in the back of the head. Uh, it's happened over and over and over again. These people are being played um they're being useful idiots, as Lenin used to put it. Now, when Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, he believed that this revolution would occur hundreds of years later uh, once countries had developed full capitalism, had gone to that stage of development, as he, you know, referred to it, and then they would be ripe for socialism, communism. Um, So Russia was a very agrarian country, peasants, uh, very feudalistic at the time, uh, in the 1900s still, under the Tsars, um, but yet by the time of World War II, massive industrial powerhouse, as if they kind of had gone through some sort of modernization. How did they get from agrarian farm, farm-like to this massive industrialized state by you know, the 1950s under Stalin? It was entirely 
the work of American capitalists, entrepreneurs, businesses, some of the biggest uh, industrial concerns in the United States built up the Soviet Union and their military machine. And during World War II, it was in your face. I mean, they were like openly talking about it as if it were a good thing. We had the Lend-Lease program where our engineers, our technicians, our companies were being paid by taxpayers to go over to Russia and build them truck factories, tank factories, plane factories. We were shipping food, tobacco, nuclear secrets uh, through Alaska, everything that they could possibly want. They just basically had a catalog. Anything they wanted from the United States, the U.S. government was sending them. And, oh, it's for Uncle Joe. He's our ally in, in uh, you know fighting against Nazis. And so uh, n- never mind the fact that the Nazis and the communists were like this until they turned on each other because ideologically they're very, very similar. And didn't the Soviet government. Union help build up a Nazi war machine right before World War II as well? They were allies. In fact, the New York Times reported that uh, one of the top Nazis, Goebbels, had said publicly that Lenin was one of the greatest men alive, second only to Adolf Hitler, okay? I mean, they were peas in a pod. They were both totalitarians. So when Lenin and Stalin adopted the the, the five-year plan, the first five-year plan, the, the idea behind that was to get Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, to equal par economically with the, West, the, Western, with the rest of the Western world. How did they uh, achieve that? Uh, did they... Re- rely on Western money, Western you know factories to build all those tractors and so forth like that. They absolutely did. Western engineers came over and actually built factories for them, and you know they realized pretty quickly. And I, I I have to assume they knew all along that communism was not a productive system, right? They they tried to collectivize the farms and what happened. There was no food anymore, right? So it, it, they I think they realized pretty quickly that this was not a, a way to produce prosperity or to industrialize a nation. So they came up with this phone. Oh, we're going to do a new economic plan. We're going to have economic reforms. Western businesses, why don't you guys come here and you, we'll let you make some profits and all that. You just have to build us factories and you know bring us uh, technology and Western know-how. And yeah, U.S. taxpayers, you guys should finance that, right? We'll, we'll pay it back someday. So that's what they did. And, and American companies, including some of our biggest industrial concerns, went over to the Soviet Union, uh, helped them get oil out of the ground, helped them refine it, helped them build trucks, airplanes, tanks, uh, gave them technology. Same, actually, that's what happened in communist China. They have stolen Western technology technology and know-how. They've copied it and they've created their own factories using slave labor to be able to outcompete Western companies. Uh, it's grotesque what has been happening, but no communist system could survive without leeching off the productivity of freer nations. Are big Wall Street companies, big multilateral, multinational corporations, are they still financing communism abroad? Like China, for example, all these factories that are there, are is that building up the communist state and communist revolution worldwide? Flagrantly. I mean, it, openly. They, they don't even really bother to conceal it anymore. Uh, and it's been going on for decades. You know, David Rockefeller went over to communist China in the early 1970s before, you know, that was even technically supposed to be happening. And he wrote a, a column, an op-ed in the New York Times called From a China Traveler. And his conclusion, I mean, people should read the whole column. It talks about how great this dedicated administration and unity of purpose. And then he gets to the conclusion. He says, uh, and I'm quoting, the social experiment under Chairman Mao was one of the most important and successful in all of human history. And yeah, they slaughtered tens of millions of people. We don't mention that, but yeah, you know, what kind of person thinks that slaughtering 50 million, by that time, maybe more individuals, uh, is a successful social experiment, a sicko, right? And yet you have all these major Western so-called capitalists who've been building up communist China at every step of the way. It continues to this day. Bill Gates and and, uh, the mass murdering dictator of China, Xi Jinping, they're like two peas in a pod. Uh, Michael Bloomberg, I mean, just, you know, name a globalist billionaire. And uh, George Soros, right? He said openly in an interview with the Financial Times while he was receiving his Globalist of the Year award that communist China has a better functioning government than the United States. Communist China should, uh, and I quote, own the new world order in the same way that the United States owns the current world order. Communist China is, I think, the model that these totalitarian capitals who've been financing communist revolution around the world want to use for their new world order. And, and once you understand that, I think you understand really the way that the deep state operates and their ultimate objectives. Now, before you mentioned Antifa and Black Lives Matter, who um, are their benefactors? You know, that's, that's the big question. Who's funding Antifa? Who's funding uh, BLM? Are there any big Wall Street uh, firms and bankers that are behind that? Oh, George Soros is one of the obvious candidates. You know, a lot of people, they think, they look at George Soros and they're like, oh, he is Dr. Evil. He is the mastermind. I, I would say, first of all, you know, Satan's really their commander in chief. But 
above and beyond George Soros, George Soros got to start with Rothschild money. Uh, back in the late 1960s, early 1970s, his quantum fund was financed by the Rothschild banking house. This was documented in the Washington Times. It's an established fact. He's been convicted for insider trading. He's not a great businessman. He's got connections that tell him how the market's going to move. And we have hacked documents proving he was financing Black Lives Matter before anybody knew there was a Black Lives Matter. Um, we got, for example, a 2015 document from the uh, Open Society Foundation's U.S. Programs Board where they talk about, hey, this stuff in Ferguson, this is excellent. We need to provide financing. They said they were going to in invest $650,000 in training leaders and building this infrastructure for the purpose, they said, of creating this Black Lives Matter national movement for developing their leadership, and ultimately, they said, for dismantling inequality that is upheld by local law enforcement. So they want to abolish our police. They want to steal our money. George Soros, of course, put all of his billions into a tax-exempt foundation. So he's not going to have his money confiscated by these revolutionaries, by this government that they want to build. Uh, it's the middle class. It's the poor who are going to end up paying for all this. And people like Soros and many of the biggest um, businesses in the United States are openly financing. You can go anywhere online, look for a list of companies financing Black Lives Matter. I mean, you'll see dozens of Fortune 500 companies that are openly shoveling money into a communist revolution. So when we see companies like that are doing um, virtue signaling, right? And they, like the NBA, for example, on the, on the sides of the court saying Black Lives Matter, is this virtual signaling um, an example of that of that Wall Street and you know capitalist financing of uh, of communist revolution? Well, I think there's several things going on. One is absolutely that you have the the uber elites that are openly pushing these companies, these the NBA things like that to promote this communist revolution. There's other things at work too. I mean, not every CEO we, mm -hmm. of one of these big companies uh, necessarily understands that they're financing a communist revolution. They just they, maybe they don't want to be perceived as racist. Part of it's like you know the mafia. Well, you better pay up or we will stop protecting you. And you know what that means, right? We'll be back with a baseball bat. And they'll say, oh, this company doesn't support social justice, so we should boycott them. And the media has created a, a very fraudulent impression. Some of them don't realize that all three of the co-founders of the Black Lives Matter movement are self-proclaimed Marxists, right? Some of them don't realize that on their own website they called for dismantling the nuclear family. Okay, A lot of these people don't realize that. They're being used as useful idiots. And it's ironic because they will also be some of the first first ones to be executed and liquidated if and when the revolution succeeds. Where could others go to learn more about the, what you're talking about? Well, we have written about it very extensively in the New American Magazine. Um, I, I would say uh, this is the basic primer right here. Okay, Th This goes back to the Bolshevik Revolution. It's called Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution by Anthony Sutton, I think one of America's most important historians, certainly of the 20th century, uh, Stanford University researcher. And he relies almost exclusively on official U.S. government documents to prove that the Bolshevik Revolution was funded almost entirely from Wall Street. And, and I mean, that's the, the first piece of the puzzle. And I, I really recommend that people go to The New American, at thenewamerican.com. We've got tons of articles talking about this, even recently with Black Lives Matter and all the rest of it. Um, lots of different sources of evidence. Uh, one of the really interesting ones is where you have deep state operatives admitting this sort of stuff. So, uh, you know, one of the books that I got early on um, as I was starting to research this stuff is called Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley. He was a professor of history at Georgetown University, a mentor to Bill Clinton. And um, he explains in this book, he, he kind of boasts that, oh, I'm part of the club, you know, and I, for a couple of years I even got to examine all their secret papers. He says, I agree with them. You know, I agree with them. He says they want to build a global, feudalist-style world government where they will control the economy and the political system of every nation. He says, I agree with that. That's a good idea. He says, my chief difference of opinion is that they want to be in the shadows. They want this all to be secret, and I think they should be known. So in this book, he talks about how um, the you know what we call today the deep state he calls it the anglo-american establishment but that they operate very much in the way that the radical right that would be you know everybody with the a, vast right-wing conspiracy right exactly you that, and me. that's us, that's us right uh <laughs> believe that the communists act and then he says um you know they frequently cooperate with the communists they have no aversion to doing that and once you understand that communism is is a tentacle of a much broader uh effort to enslave humanity, then you really truly understand what has been going on with all these communist revolutions, with the enslavement and the mass murder of the Cubans, the Vietnamese, the Cambodians, the Chinese, the Russians, the Venezuelans, you know, we could go on, right? Um, hundreds of millions of people dead as a result of this. And the, the elites behind it 
are not bothered at all. In fact, I think they get a kind of sick amusement out of it. And um, anybody who thinks America is immune from these wicked, wicked men and these wicked forces is, I think, kidding themselves. Last question. What can people do to stop this financing of communism? Is there any actions that the average person watching can take? Uh, there's a whole bunch. I would say thing number one, go to JBS.org. And if you're not a member of the John Birch Society, sign up. This is the only organization on a national scale that has really been holding the line on these crucial issues. It's been talking about this for 60 years. You know, there's some Johnny come lately who've been talking about it, and that's good. But the JBS has been the tip of the spear for decades. Um, another thing is just think about your, your habits as a consumer. You know, if you're unhappy with a business that's financing a communist revolution in your hometown where you know maniacs are burning down buildings in your city and demanding that we abolish the police and demanding that we behead uh, you know capitalists and, and rob the middle class stop patronizing that business to the best of your ability and uh, you know hit them where it hurts if you're a shareholder of one of these companies uh, you know stand up either send in your comment or stand up in a meeting and say why is this company wasting my shareholder money funding communist revolution there are all kinds of things people can do. But uh, I do encourage people, first of all, to get educated. Once you're educated, then that will help you to take effective action. Thank you so much, Alex. It was a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you so much, Christian. As Alex Newman suggested, we recommend that you read the book, Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, the remarkable true story of the American capitalists who financed the Russian communists by the late Professor Anthony C. Sutton. In fact, you can purchase it along with two other of Sutton's books in the Wall Street Trilogy on shopjbs.org. And, of course, we invite you to join the freedom fight through membership in the John Birch Society. Until next week, take care and God bless.